Hi everybody, welcome to another Pork Report podcast. We have an ultimate Pork Pantry album podcast today, so it's going to be a lot of fun with our very special guest, Randy McStein. Hey guys. Who, who as we're doing this, is a member of the uh, Pork Pantry band, the tour, the whole thing. We're going to get into all that. It's really exciting. Congratulations on that, man. That's, uh, yep. that's pretty awesome. And uh, also much. joining Bye. us here, uh, you know these guys, Jeff Bailey and Mr. Prognick. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome, Hello. gentlemen. So we uh, actually found out about the news while uh, Nick and I were on Cruise to the Edge with you. And you, uh, I guess, had been sitting on this for a while. And then it just appeared on, on socials while we, were, while we were all on the ship that you were going to be the, the touring uh, guitarist for the band. So um, that must have been fun. Did you know they were announcing it that day? No, it's actually, it's, it's, if we have time for a quick, I think, funny story. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been holding on to the information for an incredibly long time. And, uh, you know, I, I just got used to it. That's the way things are. Um, but we're on Cruise the Edge. And I think that's, I've had the pleasure of doing Cruise the Edge, I think, six times now or something. And I never, uh, I never pay for the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I use that uh. week. I use that week as an excuse um, to basically just disconnect and just yeah. be on the ship. And, uh, and that's the way it is, right? So, you know, five days without Wi-Fi. It's actually a great thing occasionally. So Wednesday rolls around and uh, no, sorry, Thursday. It's Thursday morning, a friend of mine who is on the ship and is connected to the Wi-Fi, um, I run into him at like lunchtime and he says, hey, uh, Michelle, who's my wife, uh, she would love to hear from you, wink, wink. And I thought like, oh, okay. <laughs> I know what this means. Um, so there's two days left on the, the thing, right? And I'm like, all right, well, I'll just get on the Wi-Fi. So I'll just pay the whatever it is. So I get on the Wi-Fi and I check my email and uh, there's an email from the guys and uh, they were asking for uh, a, a good live photo um, to use for a for an announcement. And when we had gotten together in April for a week to rehearse, we took some photos at the, the last day, but I guess um, they weren't particularly excited about the photo. So they just requested a live photo from both Nate and I. So I see the email and I'm like, oh shit. Um, thankfully it was only like, you know, the email came in on Wednesday. So I was only a day behind. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, uh, well, I've seen some shots from Joel Barrios, our mutual friend, uh, from the McStein and Miniman gig um, on the ship on Monday from our first show. Hmm. So I just asked him if he could fast track a photo without all of the additional text uh, because it was for something important. I didn't tell him what it was. So I, I sent it in, they said it was great. And then I didn't think anything else of it, frankly. I, I knew that it was gonna be coming, but I didn't know that they were actually gonna drop it. So I woke up Friday morning and I had this huge list of text messages and I said, uh oh, I know what's going on. And uh, it ended up being uh, a really incredible experience to have been there uh, with so many friends and and colleagues and stuff and and but also so many fans who had you know seen me throughout the week uh, performing in, in various contexts and to have that sort of drop on the last day uh, couldn't have been any better in a lot of ways uh, so it was it was yeah it was really fun and yeah. I mean, can imagine that's being around all the people that would actually appreciate what that was, you know? Exactly, right? It isn't like running into some neighbors or something and trying to explain what it is. Uh, like everybody, the word got around so quickly, and uh, and it was the it was the place to be for that kind of announcement. There was such a buzz about it, and and of course everybody went on to the next step, which was. Oh, let's hope they play the next cruise. Let's, let's try, speak to Larry. Try and get them on the next cruise. You know, I think Randy knows that'll reaction. probably never happen. <laughs> yeah, right. You're not getting you're not getting them hit Stephen on the boat. <laughs> and Randy, what was there? A, I mean, to to the extent that you can talk about it, was there was that something that you put yourself forward for? Was it uh, was it something that you were approached about, or kind of how, how how does how does something like that come about in your world? Yeah. So. Uh, it, very clear, I will say that it's not something that I lobbied for, uh, of course. Uh, I had no idea that 
they were planning or mm-hmm. we, uh, you know, all the way up until actually, you know, getting together. Uh, I saw Gavin a, a few weeks prior to him uh, g- calling me about the gig when he was out with King Crimson. Um, mm-hmm. And he, yeah, he, he, he told me what was going on in terms of a hey, we're reuniting we've got this new record and all that kind of stuff but uh <laughs> we didn't get into you know the the job possibilities of me being involved I, it's, that's um so that completely blew my mind that you know that all kind of came together and and uh i've had a lot of time of course to to think uh just about a whole lot of different things and and just like my path and, and journey as a as a musician and as an artist and all of the things that I've created that have sort of been in parallel with uh, opportunities that kind of come and go and the people you meet and you just you just I don't know what I'm trying to say other than you never really know uh, how these things will sort of play out uh, including I don't even know if we have time for this, but like how I even met Gavin in the first place about 10, 11 years ago, uh, seemingly like completely by chance and, you know, just life and circumstances and timing, all these things have a way of, of working together. And, and suddenly you arrive at this moment where you're the guy and, and, you know, yeah. I, I've, I've kind of said to myself, it's like, well, there's, there's what, 7 billion people in the world or something like that. And there are plenty of completely capable musicians. We all know dozens and dozens of them. Uh, so to get that call is really, really something. Yeah. I think well, congratulations, of, man. Uh, you know, you get to a point where it's like, there's the talent part. So you got to hit that level. But then I think for a lot of these guys and opportunities like this, it's just like, who's not going to be a pain in the ass? <laughs> right that is the bigger part of it than you could yeah. possibly uh realize well you know because you just said it but i think that is that's certainly a part of my uh you know my modus operandi yeah yeah no for sure uh is is to just be cool uh just not be somebody who is going to bring any unnecessary baggage or drama to a situation yeah. uh we've all been doing this long enough to know what it's like to have that presence uh a part of something and it's it's not sustainable for anybody and uh you know no matter what the level of talent is at a certain point uh, people will just not put up with it and uh you know, especially at that intense level of touring. Uh, yeah, I mean the dates yeah, have already no, I mean, been it's announced. It's too much. It gets to be Hectic. like, just don't, yeah. you you know, let's just get someone else. Like whatever, yeah. you know. Exactly. Yeah, so, and I, you know what? And that I know everybody thinks that way of you, so it's not a not a surprise that they think you're a good person to have around and and all yeah. that. So that's that's absolutely I think played into it. Um, yeah. What else is going on? You had, I mean, first of all, congrats on the McStein and Miniman stuff because the shows on the ship were amazing. Oh, thank you uh, so some much. Some of the best on, on there, as I think everybody sort of would attest to. But you also played with half a dozen bands on the ship. I mean, it was... The busy you were, year, yeah. You were with everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, talk about everything else you got going on outside of outside of the parkmetry thing. I mean, what's going on with, with the uh, M&M thing? Yeah, yeah. So I think the last time... Uh, we had that we've chatted on the prog report uh i guess it was about a year ago or so it, when i think back to that time and you asked me this question uh i was in the beginning of what i didn't realize at the time was this i hate calling it a burnout phase but i i had sort of uh i liken it to the old uh it's a weird analogy the coyote roadrunner cartoons where <laughs> where the coyote runs off the cliff chasing the roadrunner and he keeps running wily wily coyote yeah yeah <laughs> keeps running for a while thinking that there's still ground underneath, underneath him and then he kind of looks down and and stops and that's when he realizes that he's going to fall um i didn't have some sort of big dramatic moment like that but basically 
I think that the 2020 craziness, uh, I think I was able to sort of push it off for a lot of the year because Marco and I were so locked into this creativity that we had back and forth. And it was, it was a huge uh, diversion for me, you know, among all of the chaos in the world to have something so uh, inspiring creatively and, you know, as a friend as well, like just the way we made those two records and the way we kind of built our, our, our friendship musically and, and personally uh, was it was a really special thing. But about a year ago, I found myself thinking, well, is, is this all we're, you know, is this all I'm going to do is just continue to just come into the studio and turn on the computer and move some files around. You know, I started to feel like there was something uh, missing. And rather than kind of poking away at things in an uninspired way, I sort of just backed off and, and took a break for a while. And, you know, it was in that time, you know, a few months later, like this, you know, getting the call for Porcupine Tree and then having Cruise to the Edge uh, out there as no pun intended, as an anchor, I knew that we would, that I think the next thing that we had to do as McStein and Miniman was play a live show. So we had done two records. I love them, but they're created in a vacuum. And, you know, until you can bring that music to a stage and put it in front of people, you don't really know what you have. Uh, so the cruise was a real turning point, I think, for us, because we had to finally reckon with these things that we had created. And also, I'm very proud of the fact that we, we put limitations in place, uh, not deciding not to use any backing tracks, even though the, the records are just full of layers everywhere and being a four piece and all of these kind of things, you know, the limitations I think are what made it uh, a very special thing because we had to work within those parameters of what we had. And I, I didn't know when we showed up to play, uh, I knew it was good, but I didn't know how it was gonna connect because that's, that's the thing you just can never know. So I, I was really blown away as we all were just by how, much those sets seem to uh, connect with people. Well, let me tell you, as as one of the lucky people who was fortunate enough to see both shows, um, I got to tell you, I, you know, having having to put up with all the technical delays on that first day, which were inevitable, I guess, in retrospect. But um, when you guys finally took to the stage, it, it was just an explosion of energy. You could almost feel the release, you know, coming off that stage. And, and um, of, of course, we're all huge Nick DiVigilio fans and uh, we all love Marco um, as we do you. But wow, Mohini Day, where did she come from? Um, that, that, that Connor Cole number, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, that she did was just amazing. And, um, you know, by the time the second set happened, you guys had clearly consolidated and there was this polish and slickness sl slickness to it in addition to the power so it just got better and better so so a uh, big congratulations man it was fantastic thank you so much yeah it was it was really special it was like it was a relief when it was done just because uh again there's there's so much at least from my perspective you know when something's that fresh I mean, you're just trying to like get it right you know, can I remember the, I've got to sing and play and hit these patch changes. And, you know, you can only um, get outside of your head so much and, until you get to that point where you're a well-oiled machine and then you get beyond the thinking and then you're, ju you're just doing it. And that's, that's why, if, you know, if you watch like Led Zeppelin in 1974 or something and you realize how much time those guys have spent together that the, they're playing like in another realm, you know, it's like they're speaking their own language and they're just going off into the, and you're just along for the ride. 
it's it's rare that a band can really get to that point. Obviously, a band like Zeppelin, you know, is, is <laughs> a very rare yeah, uh, chemistry. Level, yeah. But in our own way, um, the four people who showed up to play music as McStein and Miniman seemed to do something that, although on paper, I knew would be good because, you know, that you have to be excited about the people that you're going to play with. But it, it seemed to do something else that uh, I, I still can't really explain because I haven't actually been brave enough to reckon with listening to the recordings. I know that there's some, there's a bootleg video, I think, of the entire first show from the cruise on YouTube. Right. And uh, I need a little bit more time, <laughs> a little bit more, <laughs> a little more distance from it, uh, because I don't want the analytical part of my brain to sort of pick it apart yet. Um, right. But what I do know is that the people that I talk to, and again, this, this is everybody from you know, legendary uh, musicians who were there to see it, to, you know, all, all the way down the line of, and, and something, yeah, something connected there. And, and, I, and I guess uh, that is a really special thing that I will be taking forward to what we do next. So that is a super, super long-winded way of saying that uh, we will, you know, get our focus back on our next record uh, now that we've we've gotten this on our belts and, yeah. and we we know what it can be like uh, so I I plan to be uh, when not prepping for the upcoming tour with Porcupine Tree um, to be you know finishing our next record just to kind of have all of the the recording part done before we get it mixed and all of that you know um, I think that's one of the special things about the cruise really is that everybody worries about who are the the headlining acts a lot of times you know yes marillion alan parsons and, and they're all great you know bands and you need those bands for the draw obviously but the the special part about it at least for me is you get to see mcstein and miniman like that that's not a band you're going to see everywhere uh, you know or uh pattern seeking animals or um you know all these kind of bands that you know, maybe don't get the chance to tour or, you know, only play in a couple of places, things like that. So that makes it really special. And I think people know you guys. They know, you know, they've had the records. It's been a while to see the band play for the first time. That's unique, you know, made it really cool. So, And, and also the cross-pollination. Uh, I mean, how many times are you going to get to see Randy McStein actually sing Here Comes the Flood with Adam Holtzman, right? right. That was, um, oh, we forgot to mention that. That was pretty epic. Yeah. That was amazing um uh, a really nice moment uh to to have that see you guys together perform prog, prog cool. from home comes yeah. to life right? yeah that was there the, you go well, <laughs> and, and that's you know that's that's its whole that's a whole thing right i mean like a lot of what we're talking about here basically all of it is is all under the umbrella of you know what has happened in all of our lives in the last two years essentially you know we've we've basically just hit the two year mark of yeah the COVID era of our existence and McStein and Miniman is something that was not, although not born out of the pandemic, it was started prior, but it, it was accelerated and focused on because of mm. this moment in time where we're all at home and, and just, it happened to be that the two of us had started on this thing that we now had, you know, full, our full attention. And I don't know that that would have happened for Marco and I in any other period of time, um, solely based on how busy uh, he tends to be with things. And, yeah. and this porcupine tree reunion, uh, you know, there, there are plenty of interviews out there now with the guys about how the pandemic uh, influenced, you know, the decisions and the the sort of uh inspiration to finally finish these songs that they had you know started on long ago and uh and then the same thing with the, the prog from home situation you know uh, you guys putting on that amazing show being asked to be a part of it okay what can i do 
and then here comes the flood being the song and that performance having such a, a special impact for us and and thankfully for for people who uh, continue to discover it really yeah. and then all of that gets carried through to the cruise where it's like all of these things that we're getting to do for the first time yeah. uh playing the mixed nine and minimum music that was released during a, a time in the world where you couldn't actually go out and play it uh doing that song with adam and then other other things that were on there as well like you said pattern seeking animals and so it's it's a really unique situation that we we all sort of have touched uh each other's lives in, in different ways especially during these last two years and uh you know it's starting to feel like we're emerging from that i'm, I'm not going to use the phrase getting back to normal i don't know if that's really <laughs> yeah i don't, I don't think they never a, get back to normal but yeah, i don't think that's a real yeah. thing I, I think it's more so like we have to we have to deal with what has happened and then carry it mm. forward and, yeah. yeah um well said um so that's all awesome man congrats on everything let's yeah, let's jump you. into this uh, porcupine tree t uh, ultimate album that we're going to do. So we haven't done these in a, in a while, but if anybody's watched this before or first time you're seeing one of these episodes, um, we're, we're going to pick a, a total of 12 songs from the band's catalog and into what we are going to perceive as the ultimate album, not necessarily a hits collection. It's just songs we think represent the band, some of our favorites or some songs that maybe think belong. Um, we haven't discussed any of this. Um, so, uh, we're each going to pick three. We'll go uh, around. Um, you want to take the first one, Randy? Kick us yeah, off. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I should state that I'd never heard of Porcupine Tree before I got that phone call. So I had to, <laughs> <laughs> and this should, and this be I had to really cram. I'm like cramming for a test here. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Of course. Uh, my first pick is going to be a very obvious one and that's going to be Blackest Eyes. Okay. Um, perfect. Yeah. In, in absentia. And I'm, I'm sort of letting my own nostalgia uh, guide this conversation because, you know, I don't know who's going to see this and hear this. Uh, I'm sure it'll end up on a Reddit thread at some point. <laughs> and I, I think if, you know, if there are fans who are kind of curious about my history with the music, I'm going to try not to ramble here. But basically, it's like, you know, I'm I'm 33 years old. I'll be uh, 34 by the time this airs, I think. <laughs> and uh, happy birthday! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 right. We should do that. It was amazing. Yeah, you would. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, like, it, so when I finally heard uh, Porcupine Tree, it was in absentia. That was that was my first exposure to the band. I had heard of them prior, but just hadn't taken uh, the necessary steps to actually see what they were about. And I, I would have been 15 when that record came out. And I was already listening to many bands uh, that were happening at the time that would be considered similar or in, in the same genres. Uh, but for some reason, I was just late to the party with them. And uh, a lot of people were talking about that record on, on forums of other bands that I listened to. And I finally said, I got to check this out and see what it was about because I had heard other things about them prior that they were more of this kind of psychedelic space rock thing, uh, which, which is cool, but um, it just whatever I had heard about them, just it didn't, like I said, it didn't take me forward to checking it out. So anyways, I bought In Absentia on a, on a trip to New York City uh, to playing a gig at, at the Bitter End and I walked to Tower Records, which used to be like three blocks away from there. And I bought it and I brought it home. And obviously that was the first song that came on. And uh, it immediately drew me in. It felt like at that point in time, they brought together all of these elements that I was wanting to hear um, in, a sing in a single song, really. You know, the atmosphere, the heavy riffs, the the vocal harmonies uh immediately i said who is this drummer you know because it, the production sounded so good i i rarely heard drums just sound that good um and i didn't even realize it because i absorbed so much music by that point but there was just something about it it just seemed to hit on all of these different uh levels and 
you know, when you have an, a, an opening track like that to an album, you think like, wow, okay, what's next? Right. You know, and then obviously the al- the way the album unfolds and, and the rest is, is history. But uh, I think that song for a lot of people w- was that moment where people discovered them and said, who are these guys? And to try to put them in context of what else was happening in, in popular rock music at that time, knowing the kind of audience that I'm sure the, the record labels intended to reach. I, th- I just think it's, it's a really interesting song to throw well, it's out. A real, it's a perfect bl- uh, middle ground. It's, it's a bridge song between what they used to sound like and then what they were going to become if, in the subsequent albums that followed. Yeah. And it's, if you had really, it, it, it may not be my favorite song necessarily, but it's, if you were going to show one person, this is, what Porcupine Tree is in five minutes. That's the song, I think, that yeah, covers it all. Exactly. All right, uh, Jeff, you want to go second? Okay, yeah, um, I'll go second. Um, my first choice is actually, uh, no, it's not. Um, I was going to say it's the first Porcupine Tree track that I heard as well, but actually it's not because there's a little short track before it. So my history goes back a little bit but then i'm much older than randy so that's probably inevitable because he was probably uh single digits in 1996 when signify came out um i heard signify um a friend told me about the band because he had read that either they supported marillion on tour or they played at a marillion show and you know i can't remember whether he bought the cd or i bought the cd sort of expecting it to be like Marillion. Um, I, I don't know why we expected that, but um, it's the Signify album is definitely not like Marillion at all. Um, what surprised us about it was it was kind of half instrumental, um, which we kind of didn't really expect. Um, but apart from that little sort of one and a half minute opening track, Signify, the title track, um, kicks in and... Um, even though it was nothing like what we expected it to sound like, we really, really liked it. Um, I, I think that track, and, and, and again, even I've just finished reading Stephen's autobiography and um, knowing a lot about his influences, you know, it's, I think he, he's quoted as saying about that track that it, he started it off um, as a sort of kind of influenced by a uh, new, you know, the, quite rock type band but he said it ended up sounding more like rush um and i think it does kind of fall within that space of mixing those kind of you know more european um you know techno repetitive type music influences with the guitars and all that kind of stuff and that that was me set off i hadn't even heard him sing and uh you know i was i was immediately a fan and uh i i, I joked with roy before the podcast that i was probably going to try and throw in some of the early, early, earlier stuff um, that I enjoy. So so I, I, I want to get that one in. The other interesting thing sort of that I found out whenever I was doing this, because I was checking to see how a particular song I was thinking about being played when I'd seen, I've seen Porcupine Tree live once. And I discovered that actually the concert that I saw in Belfast was actually the, the penultimate concert that they played because they're very, their last show that they played together was the Royal Albert Hall and Belfast was um two before. days before that mm. so there you go no i'm a big fan of signify you know i like that album i i don't particularly get into like the voyage 34 you know period or whatever but um but uh no it signifies great I, the, the vocal tracks on there even though i think there's only maybe four um yeah, yeah. they're amazing all of them you know totally. waiting and sever and sleep yeah. of no dreaming and those are some of my favorite songs by them so yeah that's that's totally cool um and it's uh you know it's that's a good period of the band too so that that's all all fair game uh all right nick your pick all right so let me just say that um around the turn of the century let's say around 1995 thereabouts i i kind of thought the music we love was dead and i had to keep on listening to 70s progressive rock king, king crimson and uh, and elp and so on to get the musical gratification that i needed but one of the bands and i will say uh, 
the others were perhaps Dream Theater and Spock's Beard, one of the bands that made me realize that no music was far from dead and the music we love is in fact back, was of course Porcupine Tree. And like Randy, for me, it was just uh, hearing Blackest Eyes for the first time. It, it, it just totally blew me away. And uh, really is one of the bands that's responsible for getting me back into music. Um, you know, when I heard the name, I thought, is this like a toad the wet sprocket or at best a kind of spinal tap until I actually listened to it. And then, of course, I was, I was completely wrong. But I'm going to go later on into the band's history. In fact, I'm going to go to what is now the penultimate album, I guess you would call it, which is 2009's The Incident. And the single that was released was Time Flies. I'm not talking about the single. I'm talking about the album version, which is extended. It's this incredible uh, uh, exploration in 6-8, uh, a Gavin Harrison masterclass in percussion. Um, it, it, it's the kind of song that just builds on, on a very simple 6-8 acoustic guitar melody and and strumming but from there just builds and builds into an extravaganza um not only musically lyrically as well it kind of seemed to me when i heard it that it was almost biographic uh, bi biographical looking back looking back on it and almost a message to the band saying well after a after a while you you realize time flies and the best thing that you can do is take whatever comes to you because time flies almost like Stephen talking to the band that and him saying it, it's kind of over for now. Uh, typically tortured lyrics, great trance inducing use of a central idea, Gavin Harrison in the pocket, and just a fantastic song, the album version of Time Flies. Crossing it off my list now. That's already been taken. <laughs> okay. it, it's, <laughs> I mean, we have to mention that it's it, the beginning, at least, is very similar to Pink Floyd's Dogs, right? I mean, it's. Sure. It's, Although, it's I mean, really close. And, and this is a bad thing. Why? No, it's not. I mean, but it's just, it's, you know, that that's the comparison the pork, to a Pink Floyd that always follows that band around is like almost most apparent with that song, I think. Well, I think what, then it goes somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, that song, uh, historically, there's, there's no secret that it, it is essentially, uh, you know, like five or six different Pink Floyd songs in one uh if, if you really go listening for it it's you know there's a bit of time there's a bit of uh the outro is totally kind of uh sheep you know the, the mm -hmm. end of sheep right. and i remember at the time there was a lot of talk about that and, and that was very intentional to, it was kind of you know it, it largely, seemed like it had to be intentional because yeah yeah it was no no you obvious. can't you can't play it that close and right. pretend like it isn't. And I, and I don't think uh, there was any attempt to uh, obscure that. I think it was, it was very much on the nose. Uh, I think what's really interesting and, and rare about something like that is when you do that kind of, I don't want to call it pastiche, but when you, when you make influences that obvious, you really run the risk of, you know, just sounding like you're just ripping off a bunch of things. And and I think that song accomplishes something that's very rare, which is like, these are the obvious influences, but we, we can still bring them together to create something new mm -hmm. and a song that you're going to want to hear again, yeah. you yeah. know, like it, so it, it kind of, it kind of works on two levels It it, you can, you can appreciate the, the references, but it's also a standalone track, much in the way that, you know, like I know a mutual favorite band of ours would be like Jellyfish. You know, it's like sure. there's there's no hiding the 10 influences that might come into any given Jellyfish song. Right. You'll say like, oh, there's a 10 TC bit and there's a Super Tramp bit. And, you know, you can play that game, but really what's important in the end is, do you want, is the song any good? Yeah. And right. You know, I think Time Flies uh, is able to yeah. you know, no, great accomplish time. that. Yeah. Um, boy, totally. where to go with my pick? So I feel like there's maybe four or five songs when you're talking Porcupine Tree that have to be mentioned. And, and I, maybe Blackest Eye I might count in, in that. 
Um, I, I'm going to stick, I think, with that album and just get this song out of the way because I wasn't going to not have this song on here, which is uh, uh, Sound of Muzak from, from that album. Um, I've maybe referenced that song a dozen times on various podcasts and things because it's a super important song to me. It's the first song I ever heard from the band. And I've, you know, I think there's three main there's, there's a lot of instances where I've discovered bands that have kind of taken me, made me say, wow. But I think I can really boil it down to maybe three that were the big ones. And Nick, you have much references, the same ones. It was Dream Theater. Hearing them blew my mind. Then it was Spock's Beard, which, you know, I lost I lost my mind again over that and bought everything. And then when I first heard Sound of Music, I, I mean, it was like at that point, the song I needed in my life to make me realize there was still good music in the world that someone was making. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I got to see them live in a small club like two weeks later. Coincidentally, mm. they were playing near me to like 100 people, which is crazy. And I'll never forget that. And um, and uh, it set me on this whole path of becoming just a, a major fan. So uh, that I think that song is uh, just an incredible piece of work that is just uh, – Unbelievable! One of the few Porcupine Tree songs that he always played on his um, solo shows too, and I think he rec always recognized that was one of the best songs he wrote. He, he would say that. So, you know, the risk of too many songs from one record, and you could maybe take another two or three from that record and be totally fine on this list. But uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Sound of Music for this one. You guys probably know the story uh, about Sound of Music. Stephen had written a, and recorded a demo and. He played it to Gavin, who was the new drummer, now replacing Chris Maitland, who, who had just left. And having played him the demo, Gavin went away apparently for a few minutes, listened to it, and put that incredible drum part together, which is in seven, but in parts it's not. And it, it's it's one of now one of the most iconic grooves ever played in prog. And what it, what it did was change the composition that that Stephen had created. So Gavin was not just playing drums, he was also giving input through the drum kit compositionally. And apparently Stephen turned around to the rest of the band and said in front of Gavin, boys, we need to up our game. And look where it went from there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's in the that's in the the Porcupine Tree biography, I think are the stories in there yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, cool. So our first four were Blackest Eye, Signify, Time Flies, and Sound of Music. It's a good way to start off. Um, all right, Randy, your second pick. I'm going back to Signify because that was that was the second album I heard. Uh, after I bought In Absentia on, on that trip to New York, I went back to Tower Records, like, uh, you know, the next time I went to New York, like a month later. And, uh, and at that time they were still quite a, an obscure band, even even within the context of, uh, you know, the other bands that have been mentioned like Spock's Beard and Dream Theater in terms of uh, distribution, you know, like the, the major remaster campaign hadn't happened yet. So it was like people who had their original copies had them and there was no second wave yet of yeah. remasters. So you were either like ordering probably like mail order or it was just by chance. And right. the only other porcupine tree CD that tower had when I went there was uh, signify. And it was on sort of an obscure label called uh, arc 21, I think. And um, it had like a kind of a strange looking jewel case. And I just, you know, the things you remember when you pick up <laughs> CD. And uh, so I bought that and obviously know the stylistic differences um between those two bands are, are so drastic and like you said uh signify i mean that obviously that piqued my ears immediately the title track um but i think if i can combine for my pick uh waiting phase one and two as one piece because when they at least during that era when they played live they played them back to back yeah uh i think that that chunk of music uh, between the two parts also kind of does this great job of summing up 
so much of what had come before. And it kind of hits all of these different marks. I think waiting just as a song, as a, you know, you could sit down with an acoustic guitar and, and play it and sing it. And it's the song, mm. which I think is a, that's always a testament to a, a, a good song and a good songwriter. And I think that's something that actually makes Stephen uh, really stand out uh, throughout his career and this giant catalog that he has is it's usually coming from that place of you, you can sit down at a piano or an acoustic guitar and play it. And it doesn't require you to have a degree in music and classical, you know what I mean? It's, it's just, um, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's akin to other, like, if you talk about like a Pink Floyd type of situation where you grab an acoustic guitar, play a few chords and, and come up with the song, you can do that with a lot of the songs. And so I think waiting has that element to it and it has all of the atmosphere. It has the hypnotic baseline, mm, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, really emotional uh, lead guitar playing and, uh, and even vocally and lyrically, it's very vulnerable in a way that I think, isn't as obvious in stuff that came before it that might be a little bit more, uh, you know, mysterious or kind of cloaked in, uh, you know, allegory or, or just, yeah. just it, it has a very direct feel to it. Yeah. You can feel it and you can hear it. And I think that that song and the jam that it goes into um, really encapsulates that era. Yep. Of it. Great song. No, nope, love it. Yeah, um, no, totally agree. Yep. All right, Jeff, what do you got? Okay, I'm going to skip then into the next phase per per the uh, the Randy timeline. Um, mm -hmm. uh, again, I said I started with Signify, and I think probably Stupid Dream and Light Bulb Sun. Th that was um, that was probably my the, the phase of I've heard of this band and now there's a new album out, so that was very exciting. Um, in the UK, they also released a lot of singles and. Randy was talking about the recordings album. Pretty much all of that um, is made up of stuff that came out on the CD singles. And again, those were in my high street, you know, uh, you know, CD shop. And um, you know, it was brilliant having got the album and liked it to go and buy the single and get, you know, you know, some of the tracks are like, you know, t it was like 15, 20 minutes of extra music um, on there. So I definitely wanted. Um, something from that era and i think the the sort of the standout for me um was one of those singles she she moved on um i, I, I sort of a bit a bit like what 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 randy said about waiting in terms of sort of the the summation of that era i think probably that that she moved on you know both encapsulates that sort of not that it was poppier but it was certainly you know melodic it was probably more accessible um type of music um but but yet still had you know that incredible sort of distorted screechy guitar part you know very very layered and uh you know the backing vocals and everything like that uh great melody just just a great song from start to finish and um i think sort of symbolic you know was a track of sort of symbolic of that whole era i think it's it's definitely one of my favorites um, I think officially it's she's moved on, right? With the uh, uh, plural. Moved on, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what did I say? Um, did I say she moved on? Sorry. Yeah, she's but uh, on. no, I think what he what he was able to do early on, um, before they even perfected their sound and, and and changed musically and progressed, was the vocals. You know, the harmonies were just always brilliant from day one, and that's a great example of that just sitting so brilliantly the the harmonies in there and very pink floyd-esque obviously as well but that that was uh, always something he was able to do from the beginning in a really positive way um all right nick your second pick okay um, i don't want to go too in absentia heavy here but it is what <laughs> oh, it is no. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I don't see how you can have an ultimate porcupine tree album without the song trains on it fair enough from, from in absentia uh what a wonderful 
composition. What a wonderful performance in every respect. It's a disparate arrangement. It's got the soft bits, the heavy bits. And what do you know? It's got a banjo hand clap piece in the middle, uh, which, which comes out of nowhere. Um, I guess it's a masterclass in many ways of how much can be done with one riff. So for me, this is kind of like por porcupine trees cashmere in a way, if you know what I mean. Um, it, it's, it's that repeated riff, but it's given so many different treatments and it might sound deceptively simple, but it's really not a simple song at all. Also, it stretches and strains Stephen's voice, I think, quite intentionally. And that's that's a production technique that he applied on, uh, on the song. And it's just an amazing composition. I don't know if you guys are aware, but, the, but there was a, a kind of a, a, I'm not sure if it was a bootleg or official, but there, there was another release of outtakes from In Absentia called Out Absentia. And there's an even further extended version of trains on there showing yet again what can be what Stephen could, could do with just one simple guitar riff. So I think I think that one deserves a place on this album. So I'm going to put it there if you guys don't mind. No, well, that was when I said there's about four or five songs that I think are are the sort of quintessential. We like to use that word. That definitely yeah. was one of them that I thought is is a song pretty much unanimously every every fan of the band has that song up there so i'm um, i'm crossing it off my list too um, yeah, i don't think you can my, that was actually the one when i when i was i was trying to remember the 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 gig that i was referring to earlier on the penultimate uh, gig um up, up until now and um my one of my memories of it was that through any quiet moment and you know we have a slight we have our own accent here in northern ireland and uh, somebody kept shouting, trains, 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 which is trains. T-R-A-Y-E-N-S. <laughs> every single quiet moment, this, the whole way through the show, this guy's got trains, trains. So, and they, they played it as, as the very last song. <laughs> it was like, thank goodness that guy, you know, if, if they hadn't played it, you know, he would have probably, you know, murdered someone. The, um, and you played it under duress. And I should you know. also say, playing that, that banjo, section again we 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 like our kind of uh folky uh stuff here in ireland and the place went crazy in the in the banjo hand clappy bit in the middle yeah just to show you though how sometimes you know record labels can get it wrong you know we we've picked three songs from that album none of which were singles in america <laughs> and, right. And, right. and those and those three are the songs that they always play and that the fans always point out as favorites and the single from that album was Strip the Soul in America, which right. I, I think obviously they were going after the tool market is what that mm -hmm. tells me, which around that time would make sense, right? Early 2000s, yeah, the video is almost copying tool, if I remember correctly. And, um, and it just didn't make a mark, you know? And uh, to, honestly, had I heard that song first, I'm not sure it would have done much for me either. Mm -hmm. Within the context of the album, I certainly like it. But had that been my first exposure, I, I, I immediately would have said, "Oh, they, you know, they just signed a band to try and get another band to sound like Tool," and then I would have just brushed it off, which I imagine is probably what happened. Um, you know, which is you know unfortunate. But anyway, uh, moving on to my second pick. Um, all right, I think we're done with In Absentia, I hope. Um, <laughs> Moratorium on In Absentia. There are about seven or eight other albums to cover. We, I'm will, gonna... cut your, we will cut your par off if you mention it. <laughs> I'm going... <laughs> uh, that does leave me room for one of the other songs that I think is important, and that's moving on to uh, the Dead Wing record, which came after, and I'm going to go Arriving Somewhere But Not Here, um, which is uh, another, just one of my all-time favorite songs by anybody. Um this is them in their more grand epic uh, style, uh, one of the longest tracks the band did, and uh, really getting heavy in the middle, which was something really cool that they, they were starting to reach into that. And, and uh, obviously Stephen from his Opeth involvement was sort of bringing in a little bit of that influence. Um, but my main part is is really the verses on this song is where it, where it grabs me, where it's just that little guitar thing repeating over that straight 4-4 drum beat 
and uh, and I just love that part the best. It really is just the the hook of the song for me, and uh, and I love that. And I'm uh, hoping they play that on tour. Wink, wink. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go with that and poker, get poker get a little... fist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't really <laughs> not get in trouble. We're look we're um, looking for tales here, right? You're not getting in trouble. Uh yeah, but anyway, I think we gotta cover that album and uh that's that's where I'm going. Cool. Yeah, well, it's a it's a great song. Yeah. All right. Totally. Um it, it, it's kinda of, it's kind of the Richard Barbieri show uh, for me, because he, he really comes into his own, you know, those sonic soundscapes that he creates are a very integral part of that song. Um, and yeah, I also love it. Uh, Stephen also played that song in his solo set. At one he has had the, had that in the solo set yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah before. Shows you. Um, okay, so the second round was uh, was waiting parts one and two. Uh, she's moved on trains and arriving somewhere, but not here. All right, uh, final picks, uh, Randy. What do you got? Wow, this this is gonna. <laughs> There's only like a hundred songs left. Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. The funny thing about putting together this uh, this list is the uh, the sort of anticipation of what is on somebody else's list. <laughs> it's sort of this thing of like, well, I can leave a bunch of things off, right? Because clearly somebody else. <laughs> yeah. And then if no, and then if none of them get mentioned, we're going to look like a bunch of idiots. Um, <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what happens in every one of these. So don't yeah, worry. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we end up we end up with an album of obscurity. How can yeah. you not have picked? <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna trust that somebody has something from Fear of a Blank Planet, so I'm gonna leave that one alone. Um, trust me, Randy. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, I can go either two directions. One would be to continue on my uh, my sort of nostalgia trip, or to look all the way forward to the new record. Um, but being that this is coming out before the, the album. I, I think maybe it's it's best to just let that be what it is and let people hear it when they hear it. Sure. Um, so I'm gonna go with the start of Something Beautiful from Deadwing. Love it. And uh, the thing about Deadwing was that, you know, because I, I was thinking about when it was that I bought In Absentia, uh, it wasn't right when it came out. It had been out for a while. Um, I think like six to eight months before I finally uh, took a chance on it, essentially, because I think the very first time I heard Steven in any context was that OSI record. Um, right. The first oh, yeah. one, that song Shut Down. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And I remember hearing that and thinking like, oh, this guy's voice is interesting. It, like, I don't know what I expected it to be, but I, I but it was different than uh, what I thought it might be kind of like, you know, there, there've been different singers throughout, uh, where you just, you hear a name and you associate it with something in your head and then you hear it and you're like, Oh, that's completely different. So I heard, that's where I first heard him. And then I bought in absentia then I bought signify. And then that time in between that and dead wing was basically just about filling in the gaps of the back catalog. Um, whatever I could sort of, find at that time so dead wing was the first album by them that i anticipated as as a fan mm -hmm. and uh and also the first time i saw them live uh at this club in syracuse new york mm -hmm. probably about 100 people there uh you know shallow was on the radio and i just remember there being a bartender talking to a fan, you know, pouring a drink and the guy saying like, asking the bartender, have you heard these guys? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I heard this song, uh, Shallow on the radio. I thought it was really cool. And then I bought the album and he was basically saying like, he didn't get it, you know, <laughs> which, is, which is your point about singles, right? Like the, it, the whole discussion to have about this band and their choices, um, not their choices of singles, but like how hard it is to choose a single because it's, it's very hard to sort of, distill it into a normal single length, which is going to be three to four minutes, typically speaking. Well, that's why I thought Shallow was the attempt to have a single. That's what that song sounded like to me, and it yeah. didn't do anything for me at all. But I knew the yeah. rest of the record was going to be great, so I didn't even really worry about it at that time. I'm with you, Roy. Shallow was the one song that didn't do it for me. 
weirdly. Sure. Yeah. And so that's that's that sort of thing that happens. It's like uh, you, you cast the net a little bit wider trying to bring people in. And then you get you get a guy like that bartender who <laughs> bought the record and then got probably got to, you know, arriving somewhere and thought, like, what am I? What is this? What, what is this? <laughs> the songs so are too long and confusing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's a very nostalgic record for me uh, sure. as, as a listener, as a fan. You know, I remember buying that school and <clears throat> playing it for all my friends and stuff and uh seeing them a couple months afterwards i think the start of something beautiful is a, is a really interesting composition because it doesn't uh the sounds that are used um are not really present in a lot of other things in the catalog and specifically the sort of sub bass sound um it, it it carries with it i think the genetics of the older uh, porcupine tree style in some ways <clears throat> uh, with the atmosphere uh, but everybody's got their own place to sort of shine in that whatever it is seven and a half minutes uh, great drum groove killer bass line a lot of great textural stuff and then about five minutes in when you think that you've kind of heard what there is to hear they go into this whole other instrumental section one of the best parts of that whole album is that which part. i think it's is so great uh, yeah. really stands out not just in that song or that album but i think like in the whole catalog there's something about Agreed. that minute and a half two minutes it's it's really uh it sounds cheesy to use but very majestic and very uh just melodic and just beautiful um the mind to go to go there with that song when you're when you're, li you know, there's something about experiencing a song for the first time and then never getting a chance to do that again, right? Yeah. So hearing mm -hmm. that song for the first time is just like, whoa, I did not see that coming and it's amazing, you know? Yeah, and, and you know, we're all album listeners, obviously. We're all uh, real champions of the album. And I think the context of where that song hits and how it sets up the last piece is also just, just very... Uh, very well placed and um and i think over the, the years i think that song has also been kind of a fan favorite uh you know there was there was video uh video screen animation stuff that i seem to recall playing behind them this kind of weird robot thing and you know it just um it's a, i think it's a it's a it's a standout song and i don't i don't know that there's anything else really like it in the catalog so that that'll be my pick. I, I I love that we picked those two songs back to back on this, and it's we are ten songs in, and nothing from Fear of a Blank Planet, which is in, it just pretty amazing. Because um, many people we're not done yet that as top, but I'm sure we'll get something in there. All right, Jeff, what's your last one? Well, I think that because of what Randy picked and what Nick has hinted he might have to pick it. I think I feel that it gives me a certain liberty to go really, really deep for my last choice. Um, and I'm, yeah, go I'm go. going to, I'm going to do that. I mean, my, my long list has even less halo feel so low, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go with the title track from up the downstair. Whoa. There you so go. And let me explain. Wow. Yeah. Let, well, let me explain, deep, let, let me explain why. I I spent uh, over over my shoulder here is the Delirium Years box set, and whenever I got that a few months ago, I um spent an awful lot of time listening to Voyage Thirty Four, which I'd never really kind of got into before, <laughs> and really really I enjoying just, that. I don't listen to that. And I know and um. And, and then sort of listening through just some of those early albums and again actually reading reading the book and understanding a bit more about kind of Stephen's interest in kind of experimental music drone based music all of those kind of things and then re-listening to that early stuff and seeing how all of that feeds in and up the downstairs is a great example that starts off with with the kind of drone stuff um there's a 2000 Randy talked about whenever they remastered and reissued the 2005 version of that replaces the drum machine stuff with with Gavin yeah. and playing on it and that's also I think the first track that Richard and um, Barbieri contributed to um, but I was listening to it 
in the last couple of days prepping for this and I, and was going if anyone was shocked by the future bites <laughs> they they missed up the downstair because it's all because it's all in there you know and it sort of always has really you know and you know Stephen you know he talks about you know the Donna Summer track that was kind of a big influence on him and and that whole combination of I, I think that track is just a brilliant combination of the experimental the kind of trance that uh, um you know dance music influence um the uh what you call it you know the spoken voices you know which you know people sort of think oh it's the pink floyd thing but like even that's from you know from from way way back before experimental music and i just went I, i'm gonna have to put this on this ultimate album if only to get people who have never heard it to hear it and sit and spend 10 minutes listening to it and i, and I, the, I was reading a quote about the album that steven said that the, the complete commercial failure of um that album was what gave him liberty to do everything that he's done subsequently which i think is a is a is a is a brilliant kind of path to end up on where you reach the point where you're going you know uh you know you know nobody bought this but i'm still going ahead and i'm gonna do do what i want to do and to me that was just the 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 summation of um everything you know and, and you know what what better way for it to be reflected in the adulation whenever um it's announced that there's going to be more porcupine tree music coming and you sort of look at it and go it it, it all that you know sticking to what uh you like and what you want to do totally pays off so that's that's why that song's on there um, and again, the the 2005 version with Gallon on it is. Uh, I is, love. Uh, you know, we we never know where you're gonna go on these things, man. You you never fail <laughs> to uh, surprise. I thought so, he was gonna give us Stranger by the minute. <laughs> I wish that was on my list at least. Yeah, um, well, that's a great song. Just because it's pop doesn't make it bad. Uh, uh, I'm counting on you to to come through on one song, Nick. Because if not, I'm gonna have right. to do it because I can't yeah. let it go unsaid. <laughs> okay. So, give me a give me another slot and come through for me okay also from in absentia just kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding okay. <laughs> where's the mute button i'm kidding okay so let me do it guys it's obvious um although it's going to be a very lengthy ultimate porcupine tree album we cannot be without it and the song is of course anesthetize from fear of a Good blank day. Day. Yay, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, <at last. laughs> okay so um never let it be said that i let randy down publicly um <laughs> it's 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 just an amazing song um it's one of their longer numbers which for porcupine tree is saying something uh it's got a very strong theme an amazing chord progression, um, brilliant sound design, for me, a unique chorus. Um, and the way it builds over that crunchy Stephen Wilson riff just epitomizes the whole porcupine tree uh, sound and what they've contributed to the genre, which is really their own genre when we think about it. Uh, it's a prog epic. Um, the studio version has, of course, Alex Lifeson playing uh, the guitar solo. The song lyrically is about boredom in watching television, but boy, is it far from boring, that song. It's just amazing. Uh, Anesthetized, cannot have an ultimate album without it, aren't you? Yeah, right no disagreement. There. No disagreement nope. there. And, and Randy was talking about Coma Divine being sort of the perfect summation of, of that kind of era in a live format, the Anesthetized or Anesthetized, depending on what country you're from, live album is... Uh, again just totally what one of, i i i i i definitely i prefer the versions of most of the songs on that live album um to the studio versions particularly and again it was that was you know a song that really took on another life and halo was the other one that hearing it live just to me on that album you know brought it to a, a different place but yeah no brilliant brilliant track yeah uh prior to of a blank planet they had done a run of dates where they basically as they saw it at that time played the whole album but as untitled tracks it was like 
kind of akin to what Pink Floyd did before Dark Side of the Moon, where they yeah, were just yeah. kind of, you know, workshopping it. And I saw that tour and there were there were one or two songs that were slotted in that that ended up being on the nil recurring EP, uh, which I think should not be overlooked. I think there there's some really uh, yeah. if you want to talk about distilling um, where they had gone up to that point, that EP really kind of ties everything together in a lot of ways. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I remember them, you know, what had, I think fans had called the song, anesthetized the beast or something like, because nobody knew what the song titles were, but fans were raving. Like there's this song that they're playing that's like 18 minutes and like, you got it, you got to hear it, you know? And so I saw that tour before it was known that it was called anesthetized. And, and yeah, I just, I remember seeing the show and then the album coming out and uh it was it was very clear that like a new benchmark had been set uh i think for them of course stylistically sonically um but also just like uh gavin's drumming on that record uh, like the whole record but that song of course you know just because it has such juicy bits in it uh yeah, I don't know. It seemed it seemed to mark like this new sort of standard in a lot of ways for uh, almost the genre as a whole. It was sort of like, hey, this you can this is what can be done, you know, with mm. this. And I think the fact that uh, because Porcupine Tree has never been a uh, traditionally let's call it virtuoso type of band, that's just never been their thing, and and they've never seemed to be interested in that however working within what they do and then you take an element like gavin who obviously functions on this super high level of uh you know virtuosity creativity um all of these different elements when you put him in the context of that kind of composition it was very clear like what i was saying earlier about once you know who you have in your band and what people are capable of doing that song kind of epitomizes that like <laughs> lead us drummer you know let's, <laughs> let's yeah, do this yeah. thing and when you know when you get to that that middle section um the sort of thrashing mashuga kind of double bass thing um the first time you hear that and if you if you're a fan of the band up to that point you realize oh we've crossed we've crossed some threshold here like this this, yeah. this band is now capable of doing something uh that they haven't explored before and that was that was a very exciting thing i think um about being a fan uh of the band at that point in time if you had been following them you know even just for a couple of years it was clear that the, that they were starting to make these leaps and even as a concert goer you know going from seeing them in a club with a hundred people to starting to see them at places like the Beacon Theater in New York City, it was like, wow, this is really happening. It was fun to be a part of that feeling that every time a new album or a new tour came along, uh, it was growing into something. Yeah, yeah. So, so and, I have the- and, and, and wow, for, what a journey for you to be hearing these songs as a fan and yeah. now to be playing them on stage. Wow. Cheers, yeah. I have the impossible task of picking the last song on this thing and <laughs> man, there's a million ways, a million ways to go. Um, my God, it's so hard. Okay. I'm just going to do deep, it. Cause go deep. I'm going to go with, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to go with my favorite of these that are left, I guess, or one of them. I don't know. It's too impossible. Um, always had an affinity for this song when I was discovering the band and uh, going to the back catalog and, you know, just absorbing it all and then stumbling on, upon uh, the recordings album, which you mentioned. And the uh, I think it's the first song on it, Buying New Soul, which is, uh, man, I, that, I remember hearing that and, and just saying, God, even on the throwout tracks, they're like, fucking brilliant and 
<laughs> that song is uh, amazing to me. One of my favorites. It, the lyrics are just really quirky and, um, uh, th- you know, the the whole kind of cello in the background kind of really ominous kind of sets that mood. And it's a very, very cool track. Their B-sides are amazing. I mean, uh, Futile was one I, I could have gone with, which is super heavy and awesome. Uh, Drown With Me, that um, you know, there's a there's a bunch of really great B sides that are all great, um, but I guess I'm gonna go yeah. with buying new soul. I think it might be a good way to close this thing out and throw in something a bit obscure. Yeah, you know, I don't know what do you guys think of that choice? I guess. Love it. No, br- I, had, I had it on my list. I had yeah, it. good choice. Good choice. I must say it wasn't on my list. I I would possibly have gone with Deadwing, maybe the title mm-hmm. track. Yeah, I mean, a couple right. other ones, Thank just so we can run through some quick without explanations so we can end this thing, but just some some other choices maybe we had on our list. I mean, Hate Song is always a favorite. Um, Last Chance to Evacuate Planet Earth um, was, yeah. was, was another one. Lazarus is always good. Dark Matter. I don't know, some of the different ones I had on my list. Pure Narcotic, Slave Called Shiver, very extreme songs. Mm. The, the catalog is so vast. I mean, we could go on and on. For that's why it's hour. hard. Yeah, that's why it's difficult. Yeah, we didn't um, even touch uh, "Stupid Dream," although maybe "Buying New Soul" is. I don't know if that's from that session or "Light Bulb Sun." I'm not. Don't really it's remember. Light bulb. I'm pretty light bulb, sure. Light bulb, right? Yeah, but, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I again, I had, uh, I mentioned it just earlier, but even less. Again, that was you know, "Stupid Dream." Signify was the first album I got back to what randy talked about you know the first album that you anticipated was stupid dream and hearing even less um kicking it off was just amazing um and then on the single there was the part two of even less uh on on one of the singles from that there's like another uh you know whole section of it which which is brilliant yeah there's the the, uh, of, the extended the extended version, yeah which is... but that, that the the i think that i think the single just had the 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 other bit that didn't have it joined up so you no know, look a, 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 i mean brilliant and all all that kind of all those extra tracks and all that kind of stuff that's just such high quality it's like a, it's not throwaway stuff it's, it's a fun band to go really, back really and good. you know you don't yeah. listen to them for a while and you just go back and pick any any one of these albums and just it's, it's a lot of cool stuff to to revisit you know yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's no easy research for a porcupine tree related podcast. You know, I mean, catalog is just too big. These yeah, ones. I had I had written some things down, and and then when I re-listened, uh, it was it was just sort of like that. Well, that album curator part of me who was always thinking about sequencing stuff all the time was trying to think. Well, you know, if if the intention is to create an album, almost like that you hand to somebody who's never heard the band before and you and you're trying to put everything in context um that's where it it becomes more difficult because you can you can have personal favorites that you think are really cool or whatever but when you listen to them in isolation you think like well would this actually make the the cut you know for a sort of master uh list for the older era i did have stars die on my list yeah Uh, like that one i think that that also, what I said about the song Waiting, I think also somewhat applies to yeah. Star and Die. Um, it's just a, it's a really nice song and it has all of that you would call classic porcupine tree sort of uh, elements within it. And if I'm not mistaken, you know, that was also be- <laughs> talking about singles, right? I, I, I believe that was supposed to be on the sky move sideways, but some kind of decision was made to not have it on there. And I think that might've been somewhat of a re- regret um, on their part or on Steven's part or, or whatever, um, because I think it, you know, it's a very strong song. It would have obviously changed the, uh, the feel of that record. Um, but I think that's, you know, of that time, one of the, the stronger songs and, and I just I do want to give a shout out to a, a song from the new record uh, called Walk the Plank, mm. um, which when people hear it, uh, all I can say is that when I heard it for the first time, 
uh, sitting down here in, in the studio slash listening room, you know, it was like, I'm listening to this album that almost nobody in the world has at this point in time and trying to basically engage it from the fan side of me who is great to revisit on this podcast because, uh, you know, truthfully, like there was a time where Porcupine Tree and a lot of other bands were like very central to what I was listening to, the concerts I was going to and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, when they went away, I, that's when I kind of went away too. And I just explored other things. So coming back to it now, yeah. I have a lot more of a neutral cool. um, sort of perspective. I can, I can still tap into that, that kid who was going to shows who, and listening to the stuff all the time, but I've gotten enough distance to it where now it's like, I can kind of meet it head on as somebody who's also just done my own thing and had my own yeah, yeah. path. So listening to, closure continuation for the first time was a really wild experience because it was like I'm, I'm trying to listen to it just let the music sort of wash over and just experience it but I would also find myself listening and be like I wonder if I'm that's the part I'm gonna play or that's so early on it wasn't nothing had been defined yet it was just like listen to the record and all of that um so when walk the plank came on which is towards the end of the record my ears immediately perked up. I said, oh, what is this? This is different. And I find myself uh, really coming back to that song as like a clear marker of what the continuation part of the band could be. It kind of hints at what is possible. But also I think that song, it kind of, um, it kind of wraps up where everybody has sort of been and sort of gone in a weird way. Uh, it's very Richard driven, uh, very like vintage uh, Japan. You know, it's like something that could have been out of Tin Drum, which had a huge influence on both Gavin as a drummer and, and mm -hmm. Stephen as a mm -hmm. songwriter. And, you know, so it was just this really cool moment of realizing like, oh yeah, Richard is like, you know, he's the OG of the band. He's the, he has that, first uh wave of influence that influenced those guys and then you know it's carried through to this song gavin's drumming it's it's like it's like pure gavin but it's also a bit of steve jansen as well and then it's got the stevens more electronic leanings of where he's seems to be at at the moment in his own solo career and I just I find it very interesting to hear it through the porcupine tree filter because mm -hmm. it really highlights the difference perhaps between uh how the song would have been if it would have been a, like a Steven solo track and how it sounds when you when you bring those three guys together to play a piece of music and then the sum becomes greater than the parts and you say ah that's why this is porcupine tree because yep. it's no these exactly yeah and, you know, so no matter what the style is, it's, it's them. It's, it has no other choice but to be Porcupine Tree. So I, I think Walk the Plank is a really cool song. We've, uh, we've all had a chance to hear the album. It's, it's great. It's, it's fantastic. We obviously don't want to give away too much. Uh, we, have, we will have a review up on the website soon. Maybe by the time this is aired, we'll, we'll post it. I'm not sure what will come first uh, yet. But, um, yeah, it's a great, great album. Um, you know, that's a great song. But I mean, the whole yeah. thing is great. Yeah. I like the bonus tracks a lot. <laughs> Those are some of my favorite songs on there too. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff, and excited to see that. Uh, all right, man. So uh, the tour uh, kicks off in September. Um, everybody, go ahead and uh, and check out Porcupine Tree, and uh, you'll see Randy on stage there. And congrats on uh, all your. Uh, success and uh everything that's happening man we're happy for you and uh very excited to have had you uh, on and chat a little bit today it's been fun yeah thank and let's you. just remind remind everybody about randy's Bandcamp subscription page which oh, yeah, has yeah. a lot of great content yeah absolutely you're here yeah and uh yeah. yeah just i can't thank you guys enough you know for obviously uh well i love doing these panel things anytime let me know and uh but just also just you know like i said earlier it's it's the support and the connection that we all kind of have through these things uh, 
I think is very, well, it's very special. And, uh, and I just thank you guys for what you do and, and uh, for, you know, continuing to support uh, people like myself. Uh, it's great. Very welcome, man. Thank you. Great words and uh, appreciate it. And uh, yeah. all right. So uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Uh, there'll be there's an audio version of this as well on the website and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay on top of all our socials and progreport.com and everything. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, Bye everyone. Guys. All right. See ya. Bye, Randy. Thanks, guys. All right.